Uh, this is Paul's epistle to the Romans, and uh, the way Paul organizes his letters, he, he follows a pattern. And in uh, Paul's epistles, his letters, and by the way, I like to read the epistles of Paul. I think that's, if, if you want to study the, what I, you know, I think there's a hierarchy of things of importance in the Bible. I think the most important things to study first are the letters of Paul, because he writes to people just like us. He's writing to Christians. And what I find is, if I can digest and understand what Paul's saying, it uh, helps to unlock and open up everything else. Uh, that's been my experience. Anyway, Paul's pattern of writing his epistles is he, in the first part of his letters, he doesn't tell his readers to do anything. He tells you what's already been done. He tells you what God has already done for us through Christ, uh, through his death and resurrection on the cross. By the way, that was something that Jesus did in uh, coordination with God. If some people fuss and fight about who, who crucified Jesus. Well, uh, God did it. Uh, that's what it tells us in Isaiah chapter 53. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. Now, why would God want to crucify Jesus? Because Jesus was standing in for you. And you deserve punishment, but God loved you so much. That's what John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Isn't that what it says? Yeah, and the reason he sent him was to take your place. And uh, Jesus received on the cross the punishment that we all deserve. God never planned to punish you for your sins. He always planned from the very beginning to punish Jesus in, in your place. Revelation chapter 12 tells us that Jesus was as a lamb that slain from the foundation of the world. Now, why does it say that? It means before God ever made the world, he had Jesus in mind. And Jesus was willing as well. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, Nobody can take my life from me. I freely lay it down of myself. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We're the sheep. He's the good shepherd. He gave his life for us. That's the gospel. Paul, usually in his epistles, spends the first half telling us about that and elaborating on it, telling us all the good news. He doesn't tell us to do anything. He tells us what God has done for us. See, that's where he puts all the emphasis. And what I find is, if, that's grace, by the way. If, if I'll put all the emphasis on that, I'm putting where it belongs because the real strength and the real power of the Christian life is not what you do for God, but what God has done for you. Amen. And our part in that is to believe in it, to trust in it, and then to walk in the light of it. So after Paul has spent, in the case of Romans, he spends eight chapters telling us what God has done for us. And that's pretty you know, large body of uh, text. Eight whole chapters telling us what God has done for us through Christ. And then he takes a little detour in Romans that he doesn't take in the other epistles and talks about Israel and the old covenant people of God and what's their status. And that's an interesting topic, 9, 10, and 11. Chapter 12, Paul comes to the practical part of his epistle talking about uh, how do we as believers who believe in and trust in what Jesus has done for us, how then do we live our lives and walk in the light of that? And here in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, is a very familiar verse. I'm sure you've probably heard this before. Uh, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now when Paul says, Be not conformed to the world, he says that, but he doesn't define it. He doesn't explain what it means, or what, uh, what specifically it means. He just says, Be not conformed to the world. And because he doesn't specifically define it, and just says it, uh, over the years in the church world, uh, it's been sort of defined for us in church life, I guess, or in the church world, all kinds of multitudes of different kinds of ways. Uh, usually, um, uh, and, and I don't, don't be offended if I say this, usually in a lot of what I consider to be trivial ways. Uh, I've mentioned this before, I've got a book in my office called Denominations in the United States, and uh, I haven't read it recently, but I used to spend a lot of time reading it, and it was fascinating to me to read about all these different denominations, and what's interesting, what makes the story interesting is why they all split into various different groups, and uh, I remember reading about this one, and I couldn't believe what I read. I, I read this, this particular denomination that split over the necktie issue, and I couldn't understand what, what in the world could be the issue about neckties, and I used to mention that every now and then. One time, uh, a lady in, in the service she came up afterwards and, and explained to me. I said it in a kind of a laughing way. This church split over the necktie issue. I thought in my mind, since having gone to a, a place where they told us, don't ever get up and preach unless you have a jacket and tie on. Well, I don't have a jacket, but see, I got my tie, so I'm just... Anyway, I thought part of the necktie issue surely is, is, well, if you don't want to conform to the world, then you should wear a necktie, because the world's casual. I thought, you know, neckties are formal and church. Well, it was just the opposite I found out. 
uh, the necktie represents to the people that split about it, uh, people in the world, businessmen, for instance, wear a necktie. So if we want to be not conformed to the world, well, we don't wear a necktie. Well, can you understand that's trivial? Would you agree that's kind of a trivial thing? Yes. Uh, I, I remember hearing another man that grew up in a, in a denomination, uh, uh, a particular, see, different denominations put different kind of emphasis on different things. And in growing up, he was told in church, don't be conformed to the world. And what that meant, what they told them is, well, when you go to public school, when you go to school and they have gym class, uh, don't wear shorts because the world wears shorts. So he, he couldn't go to gym class because they had to wear shorts. So he didn't, he had a weight problem all his life because he didn't have any exercise because the church told me can't wear shorts. I, I made a list one time. This reminds me, I haven't read this for a while. I made a list of all the different things uh, that you're not supposed to do to uh, not conform to the world. I hope this doesn't offend you, but I, I thought these were kind of interesting. And I'm going to give you this list in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, here's the things you have to avoid to not be conformed to the world. Bands, baseball, boating, bowling, circuses, fireworks, football, loitering, parades, skating, valentines, and zoos. Also uh, uh, on the bad list are parks, beach parties, big dinners, chatting on the phone. Uh, Christmas trees, crossword puzzles, home movies, ice cream socials, kissing bees, scenic railroad trips, and visiting railroad, uh, visiting relatives, and going on automobile trips on Sundays. Now, different denom these are just a, com a compiled list of different denominations and all the things they tell you to do to not be conformed to the world. Now, I hope, after going through that, I hope you would agree that all those things are kind of. Would you agree those are all kind of trivial things? Well, but <laughs> I, I don't think Paul, when he wrote "Be not conformed to the world," had in mind. Uh, ice cream, <laughs> or shorts, or neckties, or things of that kind. But I want to talk about one thing, uh, a, a, an aspect of the world that would actually be in your benefit not to conform to. And that is, what motivates us to behave and behave in a proper way? Now in the world, there is one primary motivation for behavior, and that is fear. I was talking to uh, April, my wife, this morning, and uh, she is, is trained as a public school teacher. Both of us, by the way, uh, have been through teacher training in college. I teach at the university here. and She taught public school for several years, third grade was her grade. And she told me this morning, we were talking about this, and she said that at the, at the last year before they got their teaching certificates, uh, the principal of charity schools uh, came over to talk to them, to talk to them about practical things about teaching. And he was talking to them and going on and on about different things. And he finally came to me. He said, I want to tell you what your number one way to motivate the students will be. Your number one motivation. And then he paused for a minute. She said, we were all just dutifully writing down, taking notes. And then he slammed his book down on the podium really loud and made everybody jump and drop their pencils. And he said, fear, fear is the main motivation to make the <laughs> students behave. And you know what? Sad to say, that's true. Now. My experience is not with little third graders, but my experience is with uh, college students, mostly freshmen. But I'm, I'm here to tell you, and I uh, hope none of them ever see this video. <laughs> but I don't care. Maybe they should. Maybe it would be good for them. I, I have to motivate them with fear. And I can't motivate them with fear of a spanking, but fear of getting a bad grade. And I'll tell you what, I, with very few exceptions, sometimes I have good students who will just, on their own, do what's required. Most of the time, they will do the absolute minimum that they can do to get by and get a grade. And so I have to spell it out. And I have to sometimes, if they have too many absences, or you know, I have to kind of tell them a little bit, you know what, you're going to get a bad grade. You're going to, you might fail. If you have one more, you know, fear seems to be the number one motivation uh, for student, most students. And, uh, and that, that's been my experience as well. Now, as you know, uh, the way laws work, the way the civil laws work, Mostly they work by fear. Uh, when you see the uh, policeman coming down the road, you know what I do? That's why I put my seat on. Because <laughs> I don't want to get a ticket. And uh, I've gotten tickets before, uh, I hate to admit this, but I've gotten a uh, ticket before for running through the stop signs. Not that I ran through it full speed. I slowed down, looked both ways, and went on. I didn't come to a complete stop. I've gotten tickets before. So that, that paying those fines has motivated me when I come to the stop sign. I remember, I'm afraid. I don't want to see the policeman. And that motivates me, see? <laughs> There's a better motivation, by the way, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I, I also want to tell you this uh, in the Old Testament. Now, this might, I, I hope this doesn't offend you, uh, but, but it's just a fact. It's just a, and it's a useful fact. It's a beneficial fact. The most important thing about your Bible is that it is divided into two parts. Now, this is undeniable. It's divided into old and new. It's